Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'd like to welcome you to the Euroclima Plus um, pavilion here at COP26. My name is Andrew Seiner, and I work with the European Commission on the Euroclima Plus team. So I'd like to welcome you all here. A warm welcome to our guests, to our speakers, to everyone joining us here this afternoon, both in person and virtually. I'd like to start by giving the floor to Senator Jack Wagner, who is the head of the Environmental Committee in the Senate in Brazil, who will be opening this session. Jack, you have the floor. Gracias. Obrigado. Obrigado pela, pelo Euroclima ter abrigado a nossa reunião aqui hoje. Essa... Thank you very much indeed for um, inviting us uh, today. This covers, uh, uh, of course, brings together several countries uh, from um, Latin America. And recently we launched, recently we launched uh, myself uh, from Brazil and my colleague here from Argentina. And then we launched a parliamentary observatory for climate and uh, climate action and a just transition. OPCC are the, is the initials for the uh, observatory. And the idea is that parliaments and members of parliament or senators should have a more active role and also to exchange our experiences in what we've seen happening in legislative, um, what's been happening in legislation in the Caribbean, in Latin America, but also what we've seen happening in Spain, the UK, Germany, France, and that we have an exchange with all of these countries so that uh, everybody is able to create a legislative toolbox in line with um, what we need to do now, i.e. a change, a shift in the way in which society and governments and parliaments understand development that development is also about social and environmental issues and economic uh, uh, sustainability. Because without it being economic and social and environmental sustainability, then we won't have uh, integrated development. So we started pretty much on our own, just two of us. Now in South America and uh, the Caribbean, there are 15 countries involved. And also it's an open invitation to you in Europe as well, if you would be interested in joining this uh, observatory at this such, a, such an important stage for our, for humanity really. So I just wanted to open up uh, and uh, there'll be a number of uh, speakers uh, uh, here joining us uh, live. Jose Luis Zamaniego, who's the director of the Sustainable Development uh, Division from CIPAL, which is the UN organization on uh, South America for um, South, South America and the Caribbean. So you have the floor, sir. Gracias, Thank you very much, Senator Wagner. I'm um, very pleased also to welcome you here, just as we did in Madrid at COP25. And we're very happy to be accompanying this work and to be able to be taking this step today. I'd also like to um, welcome um, Juan Antonio Lopez de Urada Gamendia, Deputy and President of the Ecological Transition Commission from the Spanish Congress of Deputies, Axel Sobel, Member of the Parliament of the United Kingdom, Gladys Gonzalez from the Senate of Argentina, as well as all representatives of Latin American and Caribbean countries that are with us here today and who have been part of this process that has led to this moment. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you all here today in order to announce the creation of the Observatory for um, Climate Change and Just Transition. And it will be a tool for information sharing between 
parliaments on environmental initiatives and legislations on environmental matters that are being adopted in Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, Latin America has been heavily affected by um, COVID. Uh, 200,000 uh, um, additional people are suffering poverty today than they were before the pandemic. And if things continue um, as they are until 2050, we will have uh, lost a significant part of our GDP. But what we need is a transition, and it has to be a fair transition, a just transition, and a sustainable one. And that is why ECLAC has been pushing for the idea of uh, sharing um, policies and what is being done on the topic of sustainability in order to help generate virtuous cycles and to help certain sectors push forward for sustainable development, sectors which are crucial for the economy but that can also help uh, combat the climate crisis, because the two things are not incompatible. This uh, can be converting public transportation to electric vehicles, for instance, or uh, carrying out um, revolutions in the healthcare sector, in public policy when it comes to restoring and protecting ecosystems and promoting the circular economy. All of those issues of course, underpinned also by the digital uh, revolution and the tools that have emerged during the pandemic. Unfortunately, we're not doing very well when it comes to spending on the recovery plans. If we can, could move away from fossil fuels, 15 billion was spent by the four largest Latin American economies and only 11 billion went to um, fossil fuels and the rest to uh, renewables. So 70% of our spending was on fossil fuels. So that is not a sustainable development path and shows the inconsistency between the political ambition and the declarations that are being made on the one hand, and on the other hand, how the money is actually being spent, how public funds are being invested. And we believe that in order for this transition to take place, we need more democratic, more transparent societies. And um, on the 22nd of April, 12 uh, countries have applied um, the um, ESCASO agreement that was ratified by 24 countries. And thus, I believe that this initiative, the current initiative, could not be more timely. The parliaments that are, presented, are represented here today have um, announced that they will be uh, creating an observatory on climate change and just transi transition. And we believe that such an observatory would really strengthen dialogue and cooperation between our national parliaments and that beyond borders, we will be able to exchange best practices and also to give our region a voice when it comes to protecting our natural environment at a global level, moving forward with our economic recovery and developing best practices and sharing them among our countries. So it's a huge pleasure to accompany the creation of this parliamentary observatory from ECLAC, and we very much look forward to its work. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much uh, to you, a representative from uh, CEPAL. You've talked about uh, the common objectives that we all share. I think that it's very useful to have a CEPAL as a, an organization backing our initiative. I'd now like to give the floor to, to, the, um, to Juan Antonio López de Oralde Garmendia from the Spanish Parliament. 
I'd like to thank him for having accepted his invitation and thank him for being here. F here. Which means that our observatory has reached, officially reached, the continent of Europe. Thank you very much. First off, thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, this topic here with you today. And first off, I would, of course, very much like to welcome the Parliamentary Observatory on Climate Change and Just Transition that um, ECLAC is launching. I believe it to be a very important initiative, and we are happy to uh, work alongside you from the Spanish Congress of Deputies in order to ensure that uh, we can work together in the best way possible when it comes to initiatives that are being adopted. Here at COP26, there's been a lot of global debate on, let's say, the role, the real role that um, we can play in combating climate change and the climate emergency. And I think that there's a gap, a uh, divide between what is agreed at summits and what countries then actually do at home. And this gap has to be breached. And if we aren't able to fill it with content and real decisions, it will lead to failure in our combat against climate change because it's uh, no good to sign agreements on saving the forests and stopping a deforestation and agreements on cutting methane emissions, agreements on this, that and the other, and then we all go home and um, put them in a drawer and forget about them. That is failure. If uh, we don't make actual concrete steps to implementing these, we are failing. And that is why um, fighting climate change, fighting the e environmental crisis is uh, of huge relevance for our parliaments because the commitments made by governments and heads of state and government, perhaps under pressure, at the moment they're under intense public scrutiny here at COP26 in Glasgow, the whole world is watching and nobody wants to walk away from here being uh, told that they... Uh, failed, but it's a non-binding agreement. If there are agreements that can just be pushed aside and tucked away in drawers, they, they're no good. And that is why, for us, it's so essential that when these agreements reach the national parliaments, they are actually poured into legislation and laws and decisions that obligate our governments to actually meet their commitments. And if we say we're going to stop deforestation, we actually have to stop it. If we say we're going to cut methane emissions, we actually have to cut methane emissions. And we have to play an increasing role. We have to bear in mind that there are many um, interests opposed to combating climate change. And there are many um, interests um, trying to ensure that no agreements are reached. Uh, lobbies keep working behind the scene, both here at COP, but also in the countries themselves, saying, well, it's all well and good what they signed at the COP meeting, but it doesn't have any relevance here um, at home on our daily lives. And the Ecological Transition Commission in the Spanish Congress um, is working on the on this issue, we adopted our climate legislation before coming to um, COP26. We ensured that uh, reduction of fossil fuels was actually transformed into a binding piece of legislation that uh, places certain obligations upon our governments. Because what nobody wants is that uh, it's a win or lose situation after Glasgow. There won't be an absolute victory nor an absolute uh, defeat. It's a long road. And after this uh, conference, we need to go home, we need to go back to our countries and ensure that we adopt legislation to ensure that at future summits, 
we have a much more stable ground to advance even further and be more ambitious in our fight against climate change. So thank you very much for this initiative that you've launched, and thank you for inviting me to be here with you. It's a huge honor for me and a big pleasure. Thank you very much. Obrigado, deputado Juan Antonio. Thank you very much indeed to you, Juan Antonio López de Oral de Carmen Díaz. Uh, I think that you very much should put your um, finger on the main concern that led us to set up this observatory, which is that parliaments have to play a greater role in environmental action and environmental issues. The executives make the proposals, but it's the parliaments that approve those uh, laws, so parliaments have a very important role to play. I'd now like to give the floor to the Member of Parliament from the United Kingdom, Alex Sobel, who does a lot on this issue as well. Alex, you have the floor. Uh, Wagner, for the invitation to, to address uh, this very important meeting uh, and the start of this work for this parliamentary observatory, I want to start with the UK context. Today, uh, the Environment Bill is being signed into law by the Queen. And inside this Environment Bill, which will become an act, um, my group in Parliament, the Net Zero All-Party Group, has been pursuing a particular issue around deforestation. That We know that, that the three largest rainforests in the world, in the Amazon, in the Congo, and in the, the in Isle of New Guinea, the Papuan rainforest, all have... Uh, deforestation goods which are bought by the UK. Today we'll ban the goods from illegal deforestation, but my group has been calling for, the ba for a ban on all goods by, defor by deforestation because we know that an increasing amount of deforestation is legal and laws are being passed to allow people to legally deforest goods. And the sort of goods that the UK imports include wood, uh, goods from mining, palm oil and beef. And much of this is from deforested land. It is legal. And, and so we've called for this to be banned as well as illegal deforestation. But there's also an issue with supply chain and knowing the origin of these goods and tracking them back. I work very closely with NGOs, with WWF particularly, but we need to work across legislatures to scrutinize this and share information. So this parliamentary observatory is really important for us in the UK to, to know whether goods coming from the Amazon in particular are from deforestation or not, and then to, 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 to effectively ensure that our law is being um, implemented, but also to extend that law to legally deforested areas. I also think the UK can support the parliamentary observatory. I'll give one example. The Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics has a climate change laws of the world database. It lists all the climate change laws and the details of those laws. And this is useful for not know, just knowing what is legal and illegal in countries, but also sharing best practice in climate law. There's a current strand of work on the accountability mechanism in climate change laws, so I think it'll be a real help to the Parliamentary Observatory. Now, after COP, I'll be working with the members of the Parliamentary Observatory to link them with the Grantham Institute. So I hope they can be of help and support to the Parliamentary Observatory. Of also of um, real crucial importance are global parliamentary networks. I'm here at COP because I'm representing the uh, Interparliamentary Union. I'm the rapporteur for the Interparliamentary Union representing all the global parliaments at COP. Um, on Sunday, we passed a very strong outcomes document, far stronger than the governments wish to see um, on a whole range of issues, whether that's on climate finance, whether it's ad ad adaptation, whether that's on mitigation, whether it's on human rights, whether it's on gender. It's a very strong document which, which we've sent to all of the Interparliamentary Union offices around the world, and I'm the treasurer of the British group of the Interparliamentary Union as well, and we're utilising that as we can as parliamentarians with our negotiators. But what happens is, is that between the COPs, the Interparliamentary Union doesn't do as much work on climate. And so we need to step that up, all of us in our own parliaments, to speak to each other, whether that's through, for instance, the Parliamentary Observatory or through the Interparliamentary Union. So we have a continual dialogue and continual building of relationships. So one thing we know about parliamentarians generally 
is that elections come and some of those parliamentarians are no longer parliamentarians. So it's important to keep up the relationship through those permanent networks. And in the UK, we're a member of quite a number of these networks. So, for instance, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association based in the UK. And I know members of this part of observatory, for instance, from Jamaica or Turks and Caicos, are part of the Commonwealth. The Council of Europe, NATO, the IMF and World Bank Parliamentary Assembly, which is chaired by a UK parliamentarian, Liam Byrne, the um, uh, OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, all of which need to take into account climate issues. Some of them do, some of them less so, but they all need to, and we all, if we're members of those parliamentary networks, other parliamentary networks need to work through those parliamentary networks to create global solidarity. But I really salute the um, Latin American and Caribbean countries for bringing forward this really important initiative, especially in the, in the declaration which I read the, the, the centrality of human rights intersectionality are too often forgotten in climate issues, issues of gender, of sexuality, of disability are really central issues in climate justice as well, and they need to be put front and centre. And also the work around a just transition. There's a lot of talk about a just transition in the developed world, but a just transition that is pushing the developed world at the expense of developing countries isn't justice at all. And we need to do our part to ensure that we're not pushing down emissions to other countries that we ourselves should own. And we are nowhere near getting that just transition. So just to close, I stand ready as a UK parliamentarian chair of the Net Zero Group in the UK Parliament to hold the UK government to account, but also to work closely with Jack and the other members of the parliamentary observatory and support them wherever I can and lay the resources of the UK and the UK Parliament for them to use. Thank you. Muito obrigado, amigo Alex. Thank you very much to you. Um, thank you very much to you, Alex. Uh, I think that the participation of UK parliamentarians will be fundamental as you're hosting COP26 as well, of course, here in Scotland. And I certainly understand that the United Kingdom can give major support uh, to this uh, work. I'd now like to give the floor to the member from Argentina, Gladys Gonzalez the president of the Environment and Sustainable Development Commission. Uh, she, of course, has been also involved in setting up the Parliamentary Observatory. Gracias. Thank you very much. Very much to our special guests who are here today to support us. Now, it's up to me to tell you about how we have moved forward because our teams have put a lot of work into the observatory. The observatory is uh, currently being uploaded onto the ECLAC website, as well as the information pertaining to all the countries and all the initiatives in all the countries which are growing by the day. It was an initiative initially by Latin America and the Caribbean, but as my senator um, colleague has just said, all countries are invited to join us. And what uh, the previous speaker just said about the just transition um, is uh, very true and bringing together the Latin American and the Caribbean voices uh, when it comes to climate change and the just transition is essential, particularly taking into account human rights and moving forward with concrete action against climate change from within our parliaments. All of us here at the conference today are um, public figures, we have responsibilities, and we all wish for concrete action on two hands. On the one hand, we want our countries to take concrete actions in order to increase the um, performance, if you will, of our um, parliaments, our congresses, our senates. Um, one of my colleagues from the Senate of Argentina is here today, but we also look towards concrete action to pour into legislation the um, intentions on climate change. But it's also important for us to be able to work together with other countries. 
beyond our own continent because we know that we need everyone to be working together, both on our continent and in the whole world, to combat climate change. Now, let me tell you about the work we've done so far. All of the countries and all of their teams have um, put a lot of work into this, and this is a first um, step, a first uh, action. I'm sure there will be many more, as Jacques has already alluded to. But uh, num the figures don't yet uh, speak for themselves. In fact, it can be a little uh, worrying to think about all the work we have um, ahead of us. We have uh, 238 or 291, if you count the decrees as well, pieces of legislation and 178 um, leg pieces of legislation adopted in the last two years. And of these 178, uh, some of them had been evaluated by committees, but only 4% of those actually end up as uh, legislation. So of all those initiatives, only 4% end up being passed into law. So there clearly is a lack of consensus within our parliaments to actually push for these being law. There are four countries with a climate change uh, law on our continent, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, and Uruguay are the only four countries with a climate change law. And Mexico, Peru, and Paraguay um, haven't um, been included in the observatory yet, but we know that they are working uh, very hard and they too have a climate change law that will be uploaded into the observatory soon. Chile has an initiative, a legislative initiative, and this initiative is very close to being um, uh, binding legislation, which is very important for climate change. 25% of the legislations that have been uploaded into the observatory along the same lines of what Juan Antonio has said are legislative initiatives based on international agreements. And what's important is to see that international agreements end up being national laws. But so far, only 25% um, of our legislation is the result of international agreements, and it's important for national parliaments to play the role of checking and carrying out control and what is being um, put forward as a legislative initiative, and then it comes down to parliaments, of course, to vote on the legislative initiatives before they can become law. And of course, we all want to um, grow our economies, and decarbonizing our economies will mean taking hundreds of political decisions and it is parliaments where structural measures will be taken, where decisions will be taken, where between parties and across sectors with citizen involvement these decisions will be taken and parliaments have a key role to play. As always, I've been very much inspired by um, David Attenberg's words when he gave his speech here at the COP. And one thing he said that I would like to uh, repeat was the following. He said, if individually we had the power to destabilize our our planet, then surely by working together, we will be powerful enough to save it. So I think that is more than enough motivation to really work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gladys. Thank you for your words. Yes, it's true that uh, that was very recent, but uh, I think that we've made good progress, uh, despite the fact that this is a very um, recent um, observatory. Now, obviously, environmental issues aren't left-wing or right-wing. It's about common sense, really. Either we have common sense and should we show common sense, or we're all moving to a very bad state for our planet. So I would like 
now for us to have a symbolic signing ceremony of everybody involved in this parliamentary observatory. And I'd like to call forward those who are present here today. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go for the Brazilians first of all. So my friend Rodrigo Agostinho, Member of Parliament, also a committed environmentalist. If you allow um, Alex and my Spanish uh, colleague here, perhaps uh, if you could um, just uh, allow my these other colleagues to sit down so that they can say a few words. Also, Brenda Housting. Yes, perhaps uh, bring up a chair. So Brenda Austing as well. So these are three who are present. Also Otis Morris. Otis Morris. Brenda Augustina. Oh, Whitley, thank you, Dami. Mr. Vincent Wintley, are you here as well? Yes, it's you, isn't it? Okay, so I'm sorry about that. And also Otis Morris, is he here? No. Someone tell me, okay. Uh, bom, esses três de... so, the, so three members of parliament who are here physically and will carry out this uh, symbolic signing of the observatory. And just give us a rapid presentation. There are only 30 minutes left. So Brenda, could you give us a rapid uh, presentation relating to this uh, signing up to joining this observer. Thank you very much. And first of all, conjunto de Jax, de Gladys, de Cepal, promoviendo la creación de este observatorio. Muchos dijeron respecto a la importancia que que va a tener esta herramienta para poter talked about how that this tool would be very important to to collaborate with the country. I just want to put forth the three aspects uh, in terms of uh, the joint work that went into this. First of all, I'd just like to highlight the importance of the collaboration, the importance of co-creation, cooperation. The ele elements in which we work um, really speak to this. Uh, but that collaboration and cooperation allows countries uh, to move forward uh, in legislation uh, that is scientifically based. We need to break away from the cycle of uh, starting from zero when we have a virtuous uh, um, examples of from other countries in the region that can actually help step up the pace. And so uh, this... Um, is something that is going to serve uh, to make sure that there is a contagion of best practices in the region. Uh, cooperation and putting initiatives on the table, those that um, are successful and those that are not, really um, speak to transparency. Transparency, and this is something we saw today, it allows us uh, putting on the table what we're not doing well as well as what we're doing well. And I'd like to thank uh, civil society organizations that are here today with us. Echo House from our country, so Francisco is here uh, from Colombia. Uh, we have uh, different organizations uh, here, and their work is key here. We need to get information on the table. We need to know what they're doing, and we need to know, and they need to know what parliaments are doing because uh, this is a very important tool for them as well. And of course, uh, and this is will be my final word. Uh, we need to go from words to action. We need to make sure that we have uh, robust uh, legislative frameworks that come out of all of this uh, and make sure that our countries can be exemplary. So it's a pleasure to be here for the signing of this. And I think that it's going to be an important tool for the uh, region. Thank you very much. Well, certainly your participation will enrich the work of our observatory. Now, Vincent Whitley, 
who is the minister of for for um, in the British Virgin Islands. Um, okay. Distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, those watching online, a very pleasant good afternoon. I bring you warm greetings from the Caribbean. Mr. Chairman, the British Virgin Islands is very pleased to be a part of this timely initiative, which reflects successful interparliamentary cooperation among parliamentarians in Latin America and the Caribbean in the lead up to COP26. I am highly confident that the Parliamentary Observatory for Climate Change and Just Transition will prove to be an invaluable asset to, to parliamentarians seeking to guide their parliament's effort to help accelerate the national transition from carbon intensive societies to low carbon communities. It is imperative that we all recognize that the responsibility to preserve life on this planet now falls on everyone, no matter how big or small their society. Just last week, in my own constituency, in the British Virgin Islands, a government-led initiative to develop a major solar farm on the island of Enegada has advanced. While mitigation measures are paramount in global efforts to arrest climate change, the importance of adaptation cannot be forgotten. Latin America and the Caribbean's ability to cope with the ongoing negative effects of climate change, especially among low-lying coastal states and small islands developing states of the region hinges on our ability to accelerate climate resilience using legislation that can, among other things, improve building codes that strengthen the ability of our housing and building infrastructure to withstand climate shocks. I speak from the experience of the British Virgin Islands as a post-disaster society that is still recovering from the devastations of two category five hurricanes in September of 2017. You will recall that Hurricane Orma was one of the strongest hurricanes on record to pass over the Atlantic and the Caribbean. We have continued to strengthen our environmental policies and laws to conserve and protect our environment. For example, we have adopted stronger measures to protect mangrove forests that serve as natural coastal defenses from storm surge and also absorb carbon dioxide from the air. Mr. Chairman, as I close, I would like to congratulate everyone involved in, a, in the establishment of the Parliamentary Observatory for Climate Change and Just Transition. And thank you, Senator Jackis Wagner, President of the Environmental Commission in Brazil, Mrs. Gladys Esther Gonzalez, President of the Environment Commission and Sustainable Development in Argentina, and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean for your leadership. The British Virgin Islands is fully committed and will remain engaged. I thank you very kindly. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much to you, Vincent. A pleasure for us to uh, have you as part of our observatory representing your country. Now, Rodrigo Agustino from Brazil, a member of the Environmental Parliamentary um, Front within the Congress. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Brazil. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, for this chat. The creation of uh, the um, OPCC is uh, very important for uh, Brazil. In some countries, uh, we have a lot of experience, uh, and we um, need to make sure that we scale up. We do share something uh, with other countries. Uh, a lot of us share very similar problems. Uh, the Amazon covers eight countries. These are eight countries uh, that are dealing with deforestation. And of course, we ha share with Argentina the Atlantic forests. And uh, 
There are uh, missions in Brazil, in Iguazu, um, and there's really a lot to, to be done. Because of climate change, it's really um, time to act, to act concretely. No more time for talk. And uh, the, there are many countries um, really need to scale up. There's a lot that needs to be done. Deforestation is huge right now. We're losing, or over the past three years, so we've lost uh, an area the equivalent size of the country of Belgium. That's huge. Our government is ruining our um, environmental governance uh, with a destructive um, procedure for governance uh, and uh, civil society um, participation and parliament participation has been very important in terms of making sure that we can do something that is robust. I'd like to thank the ECLAC and everyone who is uh, working on this project Gladys, Brenda, Jax, and others, thank you all. The observatory will be able to observe, to analyze, to see what's um, working, what's not working, what's good, what's bad, and what we can possibly change working with other countries and other parliaments. Our par uh, powers are not only bestowed in our presidents. They also lie in our parliaments. And so we can do something very specific uh, with uh, civil society, with indigenous populations. A just transition happens with the involvement of everyone, a social involvement, fighting um, human rights problems, uh, racism, and so forth. So. Thank you very much to everyone for the invitation and for this very important work. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, sir. Now our friends and parliamentarians who are joining us online, and before giving the floor, I would just ask each uh, of you just to say a few words of greeting. Um, we have, will have plenty of time to talk about these things in more depth. So we don't have much time right now, though. So I would just like to, uh, each of you just to, um, to, to just say a few words about how important it is to sign this. So first of all, from Bolivia, Cecilia, Cecilia Requena, you have the floor. Good afternoon to everyone who is there. I'm not going to name them all because I understand we don't have a lot of time. But what I do want to say is that I'm really happy to be able to see this moment, um, see the light of day. And uh, this is a very good milestone for what we need to be doing, which is very important. We need to be doing more than what we're doing. Um, Bolivia has a lot to offer, but we also has, have a lot of tasks and a lot of uh, problems to solve. And Bolivia is just a, exemplary of the entire world. Collaborating and working together, we have a chance, as Gladys said, and uh, she also quoted uh, Sir David Attenborough, w together we can rectify the disasters that we have wrought on our planet. As parliamentarians uh, around the world, and here, more specifically in the Americas, so we can coordinate to make sure that the legislative assemblies have uh, their pride of place. They play a fundamental role, not only in terms of uh, what they do in their states and, and uh, um, uh, representing democratic power, but uh, uh, this is also a place uh, where we can hear other voices uh, and uh, make sure that civil societies uh, voice is also uh, represented. Civil society is fundamental. Uh, they've been instrumental in a lot of the progress that has been done in terms of the environment, gender, uh, human rights, social justice. 
all of this has to do with uh, the strength of civil society. So congratulations. Uh, this is a wonderful day, the day, uh, the birthday of this OPCC. You can count on Bolivia to extend uh, the um, representation from Bolivian uh, parliamentarians. And it's a, a pleasure to work uh, shoulder to shoulder with you to come to grips with this um, historic uh, challenge. Uh, we've never had a challenge like this. We have to work together. We don't have any other options. All we can do is to fight and do what we have to do. So we must move ahead. And once again, congratulations to everyone who made this possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call on Juan Carlos Lozada from Colombia. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Wagner. It's a press. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, greet you in Glasgow. I, of course, uh, appreciate uh, the work that you've done to make sure that the OPCC um, gets its start today within the context of the COP26. And of course, um, I would like to. Um, send my very best greetings uh, to Gladys from Argentina and I'll also thank the CEPAL, or the ECLAC, uh, for everything that they've done in helping set up uh, this OPCC uh, to make sure that it can get off on the right foot and, and what better place to do all of this than the COP26. Uh, perhaps, Senator Wagner, I could talk about human rights. Uh, this is something that um, has really wrought havoc in my country. Uh, this is a problem that involves all of Latin America. As you know, in the last uh, Global Witness uh, um, study, the um, British NGO has shown that 30 uh, percent um, uh, of um, the um, of uh, the leaders who have been killed um, have been killed in um, uh, Colombia and Mexico has the same figure. So we need to be aware that we cannot um, wage a war against um, these issues uh, um, with because we have to make sure that we look at the strategic ecosystems around the world, not just in our region. Our region, of course, is very rich, and uh, it has become the epicenter of uh, conversation, conservation of um, ecosystems for around the world. And for this reason, I'm very pleased uh, that um, Latin MPs are here today um, weaving um, um, our contacts uh, with other um, countries. Uh, and as some of the people have, who in, are in Glasgow have said, this is not just an initiative uh, that should be um, uh, uh, numbers uh, and texts uh, or exchange of information. It should also be an action group. And that's what our people are asking for. It should be an action group that should go beyond um, the executive. Uh, parliaments have a lot of power um, in this area. And as the Senator Gladys said, this is our only hope to move ahead. So as a member of the Colombian parliament, uh, one of the richest country uh, in um, terms of biodiversity and hand in hand with uh, um, Brazil here, we need to work to fight deforestation in the Amazon. And we need to make sure that we show that all of this is possible. And so it's an honor to be part of this parliamentary group. And you can count on me to continue to fighting the fight and cooperating, working together towards a common cause which is the most important cause uh, that the human species is uh, facing uh, today on the planet. Thank you once again to uh, Senator Wagner, Senator Gladys, uh, everyone um, who is there. This is, uh, and of course, many thanks to the ECLAC. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call on Guido Girardi from Chile, Senator from Chile. You have the floor, sir. 
Yes, hello, how are you? Um, warm hugs. Well, I don't ha I have a lot of uh, expectations uh, about the COP. Major powers uh, don't support uh, the fight against climate change. And many of the discussions are symbolic, but they are important nonetheless. Um, uh, the United States hasn't uh, reduced its um, uh, emissions. Uh, and um, we're already in a third world war, but it's an invisible war. It's controlled by data and artificial intelligence. And I think it's going to be very difficult to, to move forward because uh, these uh, two major powers, uh, China and the United States, really uh, represent a huge swath of humanity. And so we have to be aware of uh, the challenge. We need to have an alternative, a third way of um, we cannot um, vassal states of the United States or China. And so uh, we need to get together as Latin America. Europe needs to get together. And we need to, um, you know, give our own responses uh, to AI and uh, big data. Because otherwise, uh, we're not going to have the wherewithal to fight uh, climate change or global warming or any other challenge that is facing humanity. Uh, who? controls the data will control the future. We are aware of that. So we need to make sure that this can be democratized. And we have um, given our data to uh, American platforms. And China has uh, usurped all the data that they've wanted. They've got to double the data that uh, the United States have. So for this reason, we need to associate ourselves. Now, there are topics that we really should be coming to grips with. I am uh, author of uh, various laws. Uh, uh, these are laws uh, that have uh, uh, similar laws that in other uh, Latin American countries. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't have to just deal with uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, but there's a pandemic of obesity, the pandemic of diabetes. Uh, um, we can't have food kill our people. And we're, um, and then obviously, um, agriculture has been used to um, produce junk. And that, in turn, has um, led to huge emissions. And this is not acceptable. Uh, there are 14 million um, uh, acres uh, of uh, land that have been dedicated to create junk and um, emissions at the same time. And so we need to do something for humanity. We need to have um, renewable energy. We need to uh, get serious. So we need to, to obviously uh, be aware of the fact uh, that 2030 is right around the corner. And um, we need to get away from uh, carbon, fossil fuels, uh, gas. And we need to have um, alternatives. Uh, for example, hydrogen. Um, that can be uh, and photovoltaic. But the question is, what are we doing uh, to this end? And the answer to that is nothing. And so um, the main challenge is the um, exploitation of uh, uh, AI and the, the data that is gathered by Facebook and uh, the addictiveness of uh, social media, media. They are really taking over um, our young people. They are stealing their time and their attention. But um, screens are also huge energy consumers. Uh, and. And uh, so we have to rethink these uh, digital systems. Uh, we need to make sure that they serve humanity rather than make humanity servile. And so we need to, to continue to work. We need to continue to um, work together to see what we can do about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, um, Brazil, uh, Argentina, Mexico, Uruguay, Peru, Chile um, are all facing challenges in this area. And we really need to 
be aware of the um, indignance uh, around the world because of the lack of action to um, combat climate change and our other and other challenges. Uh, but we need to, to start to work together to um, come to grips with this. Uh, I am a soldier of the cause, uh, and I am fully available to you to exchange our experiences uh, to see what's happening in Latin America. We need to be the leaders of the third way. We cannot um, feed into the U.S.-China um, hegemony. And we need to find a balance on the global level, because that is the only way that we can have peace and equality in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for those important words for our observatory. I'd now like to give the floor to Gwendo Marcelina from Curaçao. I just like to urge brevity, please, because we do have uh, just not very much time available. Thank you. Yes, yes. Go ahead, please, sir. Thank you very much. The protocol has been served already, and I want to thank you all of you guys in Glasgow. And to remember, it's never too late to make the right thing, to make the things right. So there is no country also that is too small to make a difference. And for us, coming from Curacao as a small island, it is very important for us to be part in this major step of this parliamentary observatory. This helps us in also being more aware and conscious what is happening around us within the world and to reduce the vulnerability and also enhance the resilience of our communities and our countries um, coming especially from the Dutch Caribbean. It is very important so we can adverse the impacts of climate change as also part of the pioneers of um, environmental legislation. So it is very important for us to be part of this team and to be as a pioneer, a real example, and we really hope that all the hazards and the natural hazards that are within the world, we can uni uniformly within the, the parliaments of the Latin American communities, um, countries, but also the Caribbean countries, for us to be right there and part of you and be aware within the world how we can tackle and create more sustainability for everybody. So I thank you. Um, as you guys already said, protocol has been served, and I have the two minutes. I just thank you for everything. Bye-bye. Obrigado, Gwendo. Thank you very much indeed to you. Thank you very much for being here with us from Curacao. I'd like now to call on the Minister from Turks and Caicos, please. You have the floor. Good afternoon. Yes, Your Excellencies, on behalf of the Turks and Caicos Islands government, we support the parliamentary, parliamentary observatory for just transition on which actions are anchored on the principles of sustainable development and shared responsibility centered on the planet and, and on people and their human rights and dignity. We believe that a clear understanding on a global perspective of protecting the environment is viable, is a viable part for development and communities in small island states, territories like the Turks and Caicos Islands. The Turks and Caicos government and my ministry in particular supports the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the fulfillment of the Paris Agreement and other regional and international instruments related to environment, environmental sustainability, specifically the TCI has developed the resilient national energy transition sustainability, I mean strategies, RNETs, which provides a roadmap of diversifying, diversifying electricity sources by increasing renewable penetration to 33% of the total energy generation by 2040. With this, it will significantly reduce our carbon emissions. In summary, TCI has taken bold steps towards supporting the parliamentary observatory with the development of the TCI Vision 2040, the People's Plan for Progress, Transforming TCI Through Inclusive Growth 2021, the development of climate change policy, the drafting of TCI 
environmental policy and the TCI energy policy. In TCI, we support global initiatives and we act lo locally. On behalf of my government, I would like to thank you for allowing me to participate in this conference today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Ms. Minister Otis Morris from the Turks and Caicos Islands. Now, Federico Ruiz from Uruguay. Federico, you have the floor. Yes, good afternoon to everybody. Our country, Uruguay, has a long tradition relating to legislative action linked to climate action. A national system for climate action, which led to an environmental plan for sustainable development and a national action plan for climate change or climate action. And we set up a ministry for the environment recently. I am the director of the Environment Committee, and I would have liked to have been involved in the process of setting up the Parliamentary Observatory for Climate Change and Just Transition. I'm very happy to be part of it now. And I would just reiterate our country's commitment to the aims of this observatory. I think that uh, at this meeting it's important to highlight everything that's done in our countries. Often individual efforts, or indeed collective efforts, or country efforts, Suggest, seem not enough, seem not enough for what our citizens want and need. So the major challenge that we face as parliamentarians is to detect, promote and organize actions and lead actions together to ensure that they have the maximum impact possible. And I think it would be criminal for us if we don't actually look after our planet for future generations. And it's important that we discuss, exchange best practices, and that we agree and work together on, on the basis of what we agree on. President Pepe Mojica, our former president, who told, of course, that who said, of course, that uh, environmental issues aren't just political issues; uh, they're much more important than that. Development is something that can never, of course, go against a humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federico Ruiz. I'd now like to give the floor to the last person on my list from Guatemala, Samuel de Moraes from Guatemala. Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you for the invitation and recognize all of the work that was done to set up this uh, observatory. Guatemala is one of the countries that is most vulnerable to climate change and also one of the countries with the lowest amount of uh, public information, which means that our policies tend not to be designed in the best way for everybody. I think that this observatory is very useful for Guatemala, for the Central American region, and it's a problem relating to the model that we have, the economic model that we have, that is currently being called into question, not just in Central America, but throughout the region, throughout the Americas, throughout the whole world. This model was a decision, a political decision, a, a, a series of political decisions that made this model so we can change it as well, which is why I think that this is very important. And I feel honored to be part of it and to make my contribution. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, sir. Well, I think that we are coming pretty much to the end of our work. And I would like, first of all, to thank the Euroclima 
team for allowing us to use this uh, space and uh, for extending the um, timetable. We've just about managed to keep to time here. I'd like to thank Juan Antonio Lopez from Spain as well. This really was a representative uh, step that the Parliamentary Observatory has now expanded to European territory. Also, like to thank Alex Sobel the, and the support given by the United Kingdom, all our friends from Central America, from South America, and on my behalf and on Gladys's behalf, we are the godparents, as it were, of this uh, initiative and I'd like to thank uh, all of you. I'd like to thank also the, Euro the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean from the United Nations for all of their support. So thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have launched, have you formally launched the Parliamentary Observatory in front of the whole world at the um, at COP26. Here is the text of the charter. Could you sign it physically? Or perhaps we can just show it to everybody to show that we have. Uh, and you can see actually the signatures as well, including all of those people who just spoke now who will add their signatures to this charter. So um, thank you and uh, greetings to everybody here and of course in Latin America and the Caribbean as well. Thank you. <laughs>